That fortnight in the summer, Britain's annual playground, the holiday resort. One big family party. On the whole, people don't look far beyond that two or three miles of beach and pier and promenade. And with everything laid on, why should they? Some would rather get away from it all. For them, the simpler life. Some go exploring. If your explorers kept on along the shoreline, every headland and every inlet, they would cover some 5,000 miles. stretches where time stands still, where only wind and water have left their mark. Infinitely long ago, this country was part of the continental mainland, until, after ages of erosion and subsidence, the sea gouged through the chalk, a channel which we call the Straits of Dover. And Britain at last became an island. No matter where you are on this island, you are never more than 75 miles from the sea. And the result is a maritime people with salt in their blood. In some such craft as these, the islanders first got the feel of the water. primitive coracles still used by fishermen along Welsh estuaries today. In that dim dawn of Britain's history, our flat and vulnerable seaboard to the east and south tempted successive invaders. Across the shingle, up the shallow waterways, over the sand dunes, they sent their expeditionary forces. Norsemen, Jutes, Romans and Danes, Angles, Saxons. Sturdy relic of those tempestuous times, Porchester Castle, built by the Romans, whose coastal defenses stretched from Spithead to the Wash. At Pevensey, these Roman walls looked down upon the landing of Norman William, last and greatest conqueror of all. Behind them, he set up his D-Day headquarters. From Bamborough in the north, a chain of fortifications was thereafter to keep our shores inviolate. London and Harlech. Dartmouth. Tintagel, round which the medieval romantics wrote their legends of King Arthur. Because the narrow straits were for long the danger point, massive Dover Castle remains a kind of symbol of our security. 
our naval power was cradled hereabouts, for in medieval times, Dover, Walmer, and the other sink ports and their attendant towns supplied our fighting ships and men. Sandwich, England's Portsmouth during the Hundred Years' War. Winchelsea. Rye and the rest. Today, these quiet places have lost their old importance, for the sea has retreated from them. What was once the seabed is now broad pasturage, stretching away over Rumney Marsh. If here the sea has retreated, elsewhere man-made defences hold it back, and Lincolnshire tulips blaze from land largely reclaimed from the sea. It is too in the eastern counties that you come upon those imposing parish churches, reminders from the Middle Ages that the east was then the coastline of England's commerce. When the wool trade flourished here and merchants left evidence of their prosperity in these, their pious benefactions. If commerce looked east to the continent, exploration looked west. At Bristol, the Cabot Memorial stands high above the old city docks, starting point of voyagers whose eyes were upon a new world across the Atlantic. Then, Bristol's Hall of the Society of Merchant Ventures, who, it was written 300 years ago, sought not so much to enrich themselves as to inform posterity by their discoveries. In the business of the Port of Bristol today, the old merchant venturers would have their satisfaction. Merchant craft from across the world down to the river barges which every day on the tide hurry off up the Severn. For long, Bristol reigned supreme on our western seaboard. Then, with the onset of the Industrial Revolution, came a challenge from the north. Soon, Liverpool and other northern ports were serving a vast industrial hinterland. And now there began to take shape the traffic of the great ports around Britain as we know them today, from the Clyde to South Wales, along the Humber, the Forth, the Tyne the ceaseless two-way traffic of import and export, which are this nation's life and livelihood. must travel, and people too. Every day, Southampton is the end or the start of someone's journey across the oceans. But of all Britain's great ports, the greatest still is London. Yet not obviously so, for much shipping lies away in the docks, and the port of London is hidden, it's been said, like the heart of an Englishman. We need, perhaps, a gull's eye view. London River, flowing tideway of liquid history, and there along the north bank, those hidden docks. While the big ports grew and spread, innumerable little harbours have little changed. From some Cornish village tucked down between the rocks, away to the border country, Berwick-on-Tweed, its 300-year-old bridge upriver from the harbour. Between such ports of call, the smaller coasters travel, load or discharge, and away again. China clay from Cornwall, beet sugar from Lincolnshire, coal for the gasworks and power stations. 
Cement, scrap iron, fertilizers, paper, linoleum, animal fodder, timber, stone chippings, anything goes. Sheltered waters, but not always. And there's a hint of Macefield's verses about this tough little tanker butting through the channel in the mad March days. For coaster crews, contrasting scenes as they travel inshore. Past the inviting estuary of the dot, beneath the massive grandeur of the fourth bridge. Out from Carnarvon, under the castle walls, and along the Menai Straits. Spanning the straits from Anglesey to the mainland, Telford's fine suspension bridge. Here, the training ship Conway came to her melancholy end. Rather in a world of their own, a world of mists and mountains, the ships which serve the west coast of Scotland and whose road is to the Isles. So they come into harbour, to Oban, to the Kyles of Loch Elsh, to Mallet, At this port and at that, ships reach their journey's end. At Ipswich, Haitian, King's Lynn, Boston, reckoned to have handled in the Middle Ages the heaviest traffic along the whole East Coast. Reminding us of Boston's heyday, the famous stump of which Defoe wrote that it is seen plainly 40 miles round this level country and farther by sea. It was at Boston that the Pilgrim Fathers ran into trouble, trapped behind bars beneath the old guild hall. But the Pilgrim Fathers got away eventually, their last port of call, Plymouth. Plymouth, where the spirit of the old sea dogs is strong, where Drake and his contemptibles set sail against the Armada. And today they still play bowls on Plymouth Hoe. Eastward along the Devon coast, at Dartmouth Naval College, the young generation carry on the traditions of the Elizabethan sea captains. But at Portsmouth, naval tradition gathers itself somehow together. No matter whether wooden walls or aircraft carrier, the Nelson touch is there. And for the sailor home from the sea, always the traditional welcome. But now it's springtime, and along scores of waterways, yachtsmen are making ready for a new season. Whether at Cowes or at any one of the innumerable regattas up and down the coast, there is always the delight in spread sails and friendly competition. less intense, the competition between model yacht owners at their regattas.
down the Medway, out into the Thames, the last working survivors of the age of sail turn out for their annual race. Barges still run cargoes, grain mostly, up the east coast as far as the Humber. Since the bargemen are taking time off, so may we, at one of those seasonal frolics which you find round the coast. Each year, at the town of Musselburgh in Scotland, the honest tune, they call it, they elect an honest lad and an honest lass. And mussels are naturally the thing at Musselburgh. Gay occasions and solemn ceremony. The annual pilgrimage to the holy island of Lindisfarne. Barefooted, as becomes pilgrims, a great company trudges the three windy miles across from the mainland at low tide. Thirteen hundred years have passed since St. Aidan travelled from Iona to found a community of missionary monks. The pilgrims of the 20th century commemorate those Northumbrian missionaries who stamped the pattern of their faith over so much of England. But we cannot keep long away from boats. And these are engaged on what is surely the oldest trade along the coast, fishing. In the past, fishing was little more than a village livelihood. Steam changed all that. Steam enabled the boats to push out to distant fishing grounds. Steam meant prompt delivery of fresh fish throughout the country by rail. The middle of the last century saw the big fishing ports established, along the North Sea coast especially, from Fraserburgh away down to Lowestoft. for that aristocrat of the sea, the oyster. Wherever they're cultivated, each district claims for its oysters qualities not to be found elsewhere. There's a kind of local patriotism about it. Here, a humbler shellfish, the cockle. Early mornings on the Gower Peninsula in Wales find the cockle gatherers at work. So away to market go the cockles. Alive, alive, oh. In this brief survey of Britain's fisheries, there's still room for the little shrimpers of Morecambe Bay. Trawled from the sandy bottom, the shrimps will presently reappear as shrimp paste, shrimp sauce, shrimp patties, shrimps in aspic, or just plain shrimps out of a paper bag. In the open water of the North Sea, the herring drifters are out. the skipper and his men, it's the tough, routine job it's always been.
Many fishing boats are still timber built, the smaller inshore vessels. And there's a touch of earlier days in these hulls taking shape. That skill and craftsmanship in woodwork, which long ago established Britain's shipbuilding traditions. Traditions preserved and strengthened in the great shipyards of the North. Even something traditional about the foreman's bowler hat. At Birkenhead or Barrow on the Clyde and the Tyne, a hundred skills unite to fashion vessels which rightly are our pride. For each one of them comes her big day. May God bless her and all who sail in her. All around the coast, you find the shore-based men whose constant duty is to sustain and safeguard our shipping. The pilot, who knows each bank and shoal like the back of his hand. The tugmaster. The harbour master. And those gallant men, volunteers for duty when the call comes. The 20th century has brought lifeboats of a new design, the air-sea rescue launches of the Royal Air Force. Their work, reinforced by the most modern means of life-saving, helicopters of the RAF. To the landsman, the sea seems often perilous. To the seaman, land has its perils too. The lighthouse, despite all modern aids to navigation, is still his comforter and guide. Sometimes rising oddly above the roofs of coastal townships. Elsewhere, planted among treacherous rocks like this, the Longstone Lighthouse, from which Grace Darling made her great adventure. Sturdy light ships too, links in this unbroken chain of safety. At regular intervals, delivery of stores and relief of the crews of both light ships and lighthouses. On from the light ship, the Trinity House relief tender continues her run. Ahead of her, the Wolf Rock Lighthouse beyond Penzance. The tender stands off and sends her boat to the rock. Lighthouse crew, a month's welcome leave after two months' isolation. With safety and the preservation of life on our minds, let's look at another man on the end of a rope. These are the cliff climbers of Yorkshire. Gull's eggs for gourmets are sometimes their objective. They're equally prepared to go to the rescue should there be trouble at the foot of formidable Flambra. Whether to the crew at the start of a new journey or to passengers, the sea surely brings some sense of adventure ahead. the clock, 
departures, one after another. Sooner or later, they will return these ships back to the coast, the sight of which means home. Rich in history and in beauty richer still, a coastline with a life all its own. Ramparts of chalk. And at the other end of the channel, far to the west, the red cliffs of Devon. So the coast slips away. Land's End, thrusting itself into the Atlantic, the last rugged outpost of our island.